the same to the student. And finally, professionalism. That is going to be instilled through from day one when they are being orientated, the students as they come in up to the end. And once they have that, they will have exceptional quality uh, uh, as they uh, deal with, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the patients that they deal with. Co quality is holistic. It's not Thank just you. one thing. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, certainly very holistic. It has many uh, facets to it. If you're just joining our conversation now, we have been uh, talking about uh, quality health uh, professions education, and uh, we have already introduced our panelists and you will get to hear more from them. Please feel free to input your questions, any questions or comments that you have around the subject, that's so that we can be able to address it and have our panelists also answer that question. Of course, uh, Dr. Kelly, then we, we must also ask you, as, as being the helm of Kenya Medical Training College, what then does quality training look like to you? What would top your list? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, quality, I can say, is uh, is um, it depends on uh, on the eye of the consumer. So it depends on the person who is consuming the service. But again, uh, in terms of training, I would want to look at quality at two uh, stages: quality uh, during training and quality of the product in the marketplace. Um, as has been alluded by uh, some of the discussants, um, quality during training starts from the uh, entry criteria. It should ensure that we have the right uh, person to go through the training. And therefore, it means that uh, as an institution, we must have uh, a system that uh, is error-free and that um, when students apply, then it is possible for us to get those who meet the minimum requirements. And then we should have a criteria to weed out those who want to cheat the system, either by verifying those certificates through NEC or ensuring that as admission is going through, we identify those who want to forge. Uh, then during training, uh, quality has a lot of uh, elements, the in-process um, indicators. The first one is uh, looking at the lecturer-student ratio, uh, ensuring that we have a right mix between the lecturers we have and the students we have. If that is not uh, the case, then there must be a proper procedure of ensuring that uh, we use technology to bridge that gap. And that means that uh, we use uh, maybe e-learning and uh, joint teaching and uh, joint timetabling to ensure that uh, what could have been taught otherwise by individual lecturers in each campus can be taught from one point. And then we have people who guide uh, students at the point where uh, the students are, whichever campus. Then quality again uh, moves to the clinical area where students are being, uh, getting their practical skills. There should be an environment that number one, provides adequate number of cases for students to learn from, and then adequate mix of those cases so that students do not just learn about one case all through one single identifiable case. There should be various variants of the same case or different scenarios of the same so that students get proper adequate experience. In this environment, therefore, there should be sufficient number of uh, preceptors or uh, people who uh, then uh, supervise the students and are able to guide the students to uh, make the right decisions, be able to do the right procedure. And again, at this point, professionalism is inculcated in uh, students. So they, it, uh, they start to know early what is expected of them in terms of how to handle patients, communication skills, um, follow-up skills, being able to hand over. And then 
uh, this quality again goes to the community level, especially for students like ours who go to the community to be able to do community diagnosis and practice. These areas should be able to be conducive and receptive to our students, but at the same time, there should be sufficient experience being derived from, from our students when they go to these areas. Then uh, quality again comes to the criteria of examination, how we do the exams, the objectivity of those exams, whether they are testing what they should test, and at the same time, uh, whether it is easy to have a criteria to um, to discriminate um, among the students from those who have learned and those who have not, then uh, feedback uh, loop to ensure that corrective and preventive actions are taken, and then eventually that moves on until they graduate. But when they graduate, therefore, quality then shifts from the in process to the marketplace and therefore it now means that uh, the student who's now a worker should be able to deliver uh, at any scenario and this means that uh, they should have uh, known to handle technology been able to be adaptable lifelong learners and at the same time have the requisite uh, attitudes and skills to uh, be able to provide valuable service in the marketplace. It's at this point where the college then becomes marketable or not marketable, depending on the quality of services that are being offered by students who have already uh, graduated around in the marketplace. So again, at this point is when it is then possible to know quality in terms of a, a student who will be a lifelong learner adaptable in that environment and quickly is able to uh, be innovative. So then uh, it means that uh, quality then should be um, an in-process issue and from the point of the consumer of our service. And therefore, as an institution, we would want to know from our uh, stakeholders whether we are able to provide that kind of uh, product that can be described as a quality product. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly. So generally, I think as panelists, you have said that it is the inputs and the outputs. So I want us maybe to start looking at aspects of inputs. One of the ones that has come up in the conversation is about people. And uh, I know that we said that there must be a minimal uh, entry requirement for students. Is there more than just a minimal entry requirement when we're thinking about the kinds of students that we want to have. And that's a, one part of the question. Or is it that we need to have a transformative culture that then allows for quality uh, so that the kind of person that comes out at the end is, is, is transformed? And I would like to ask this question to Professor Hazel. What are your thoughts around there? Is it uh, how, we, how we select uh, a minimum criteria, or do we have a minimum criteria, but then we also have a transformative culture? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Uh, the truth is um, beyond just uh, grades, there has to be a culture that uh, uh, is commensurate to the task that you're going to do. For instance, when you're going to a medical school, you're going to change lives and you're going to, to deal with people who are already injured. They are sick, they're anxious, they're not sure of what they're going through. So you should also do what we call the psychotherapy of the individual. So as, I did, as, a, as a selection criteria, we should be able to ev ev evaluate the values and the virtues of the individual that uh, wants to take up this course? Is it for financial gains or is it the last opportunity that was there or is it that they have a passion? And I can say this uh, because if you have a passion, I had, uh, when I was in school, there was an individual student a year ahead of me in high school who wanted to be a nurse. 
And indeed, it did not matter what grades she was going to get, but she loved the fact that she had, there was, she was going to be in uniform and she was going to make a difference in society and make people happy and heal. And so she, she did not, she, she passed very well. She got a first class, uh, is it first division, but she went straight into nursing. And you can see such a person will give it her all because that is what she wants. Some of us go to uh, professions because that is what is available and that is what, um, that is what will give me returns or, or give me uh, some food on the table. So we should really look beyond this because a reputation had been established, uh, especially from uh, the graduates of KMTC for a long time, especially for the nurses that when they went out there, they treated especially the, uh, the, the pregnant women who are delivering very badly. They even slapped them. And so the attitude that people developed, especially in the rural areas, was that they'd rather go to the, uh, the bath attendants, the traditional bath attendants that go to the hospitals because of that attitude. And that translated into a lot of um, um, uh, infant mortality and mother's deaths. So you have to also gauge, if possible, if this person is coming in because they're, they want to and because they have a passion or it is a calling, or is this person coming in for the money or because there's no alternative? And even the values in society in relation, this is a, you, you need to have soft skills when you're dealing with um, individuals or in, with patients. What, where does this, place this person? Are they in the correct composure, in the, the correct the correct demeanor to handle and be patient with these patients? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those are uh, difficult things to grapple with. And, and maybe I can ask Dr. Um, what 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 role do institutions play in building those values in our students so that then we get the kind of product and product that we are saying is fit for purpose. Um, apart from just the, um, the, the clinical skills, what about the value aspect? Thank you for that uh, great question. Let me say this. There is a saying that says, monkey see, monkey do. When students come, majority of the students come in MTC, and I know KMTC doesn't compromise with, uh, with the quality of students. They are very stringent. They meet people, and some of the students who are coming in the professions they are coming to take, they, they, they have no idea exactly what is involved or what is expected of them. The people they meet who are the lecturers are their mirrors. And therefore what they see, if they meet a lecturer who is motivated, who has got, who is, a, who is so positive and passionate about their own profession, they will impact the same to the student. And therefore it's not just about the grade. Some of the students who come are very young and they were not exposed, even when they were in form four on what, 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 for example, physiotherapy means or pharmacy means or, what, or whatever profession. So they are coming in and therefore mentorship is so cool. And that's why selection of who the lecturer is going to be in each and every department is supposed to be not something of you know, trial and error, it has to be really, you know, very, very, very stringent so that they are mentored. Number two, uh, exposure in the process of, long time ago, like when we were students, we used to be so passionate that, and the, the lecturers used to be so passionate that even during lunchtime, lecturers were there to come and see, students 
practice or even after classes. And students who are so motivated, they would even go to KNH, you know, at night to go and learn more, to go and see a certain. So cultivation of that culture of um, uh, 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 wanting, wanting to know, wanting to acquire a skill, wanting to perfect a skill, and that is only can only be mirrored by the lecturers. Secondly, uh, we in DESTA use uh, people in the industry to come and give, even if it's just one, one talk, one lecture to students, that can also be, 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 be done in KMTC, where you get a top-notch, for example, pharmacist who is practicing a product of KMTC to come and tell them. Many students come with an element of hopelessness. So when I finish, where will I get a job? Instead of them being mentored or exposed to know, they can create jobs. They can be self-employed and even create their own jobs. If that can be instilled in them, then we, they, we will go beyond the academic qualifications and they will uh, 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 have a, 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 a desire and a passion to perfect their skill. I remember we even used to, I don't know if it's done these days, personally, I used to, when, especially the third years, call them and talk to them about grooming. Dr. Professor Mengich can witness to that. Grooming, how do you present yourself out there? How do you speak? How do you relate to others? You know, not necessarily when you are dealing with a client because the people you are relating with are the ones that will bring you a, a, a client rate alone. So again, we go to the, to the, to the, element, the element of being holistic, being pas passion, going beyond academic uh, acquisition and perfecting your attitude and your skill. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, it, there are very many facets. So we started off by saying that you need to have the minimum in, uh, entry requirement. Then there's the aspect of the passion uh, as students to pursue the career that they are <laughs> coming into. And then there is then the aspect of the institutions and how they also promote a culture of quality and enhance it in, in, the, in the students as they are going through the institutions. That, this is a very rich discussion. May, may I, I say to... something else? May I say something small? Oh, yes. Long time ago, we used to go out in schools from KMTC to, to give talks to form force and expose what our programs are. I don't know if we do the same. And you choose the very best who can expose to them and show them how exciting, for example, being a psychologist is, how exciting being a clinical officer is, how exciting being a, a physiotherapist is. We used to have those so that even when they apply to come, they are coming to be that which was saved and exposure of where they can work. It's not just being absorbed in the government. There is so much out there. There is so much out there one can do. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. So there's the aspect of industry speaking into training institutions and that connect, connection and collaboration. And the aspects of training institutions also going to, um, the, the, to, their, to their potential uh, trainees and speaking to them around that. Um, you, we have said a lot about faculty. <laughs> Maybe Professor Mengichi would like to weigh in on faculty. What would you speak to us as faculty that would say that we are uh, and that we also are embracing a culture of quality? What kind of characteristics do we need to have? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, panelists, and. Uh, uh, I think this is the right time to now talk about quality training. And when I address the issue of quality training, I want to applaud uh, Dr. Susan for having mentioned about 
what goes on at that particular time when you are being uh, trained through the process and what we went through at KMTC. What we went through in KMTC was like a preparation. The teachers you we met, uh, the ones actually prepared us and uh, we were desiring to be like them. And at one point, some of us were like, would we have ever be a trainer? That only aspect of being a trainer or a teacher uh, is what made us to be there. So what am I bringing on board here as a lecturer? If you want to make sure that there is quality training for your students, there is also that passion, the passion of being a trainer, the passion of being a lecturer. Uh, it doesn't have to be like, um, I'm coming to train, to work in KMTC because of a good prospective working environment. If that is the case, then everyone must find a way to be there. But the main thing here is looking at this trainer. Now, what do I talk about being a trainer? It is this person who should exhibit the qualities of being a trainer, a mentor, a supervisor, an educator, a researcher, and someone who would want that person to ensure that what they train the students to do, are able to do. So it doesn't have to be that uh, it is a must, somebody has to fail or pass. It is the idea of doing. So a trainer must be that person who should be able to exhibit those characters. And I want to bring the idea of competence and passion. I want to bring the issue of dedication. Dedication here for me, I'll just want to say, you can be a dedicated lecturer, a trainer, if you are willing to help that student learn at all costs. And it takes a lot of preparation. This preparation starts from you as a trainer or a teacher, where you come and even prepare at your own old time to ensure that the right preparation that you're going to give to your student would encourage them even to read more. And that preparation even starts now from the initiative of how do I also build myself as a trainer? So it is both. You as a trainer must also find ways to find relevant learning for your students so that at the end they're able to learn. So that dedication of being a trainer, being a teacher, being a lecturer is very important. The characteristics of a person that we would want to have in place to be a teacher there or a lecturer there is that we will take the initiative to have uh, innovation, to be innovative while teaching, to find out any possible way of trying to cope up on the current challenges, current trends of teaching and learning, uh, for example, like we currently have a shift to using the technology that is available. How many of us would really take an initiative to look into the current learning materials and prepare them to suit our learners? Do we just come to class and uh, give the same materials and have them uh, use them because we also use them when we were in college? So that initiative and dedication is there. Again, being knowledgeable. Being knowledgeable here means you have to read in advance, you have to work out a way so that you are able to cope with the students. The students, the current students we have are more even knowledgeable than us in terms of reading and assessing the, the learning materials. How much time do we have for them? What preparations do we have for? For them when we are in class, they'll ask you questions that even are so difficult. We should not ignore that, but there is a way to manage them and even handle them. So honest in also teaching comes in place. That quality training touches that social perspective. Honesty, integrity, uh, being a problem solver, being a critical thinker, and being a lifelong learner is very key. I would want to say, if you plan to engage or recruit a lecturer, I would just suggest that if possible, most of them should be exposed to 
the teaching methodology or an approach where they are trained to be a medical educator because they will at least have a clue of what this student is going to be in the classroom. Being in the classroom doesn't mean it's only teaching and letting to go. There is a lot that you also need to involve your students. For example, research. Well, and even preparing them to know how to read and continue learning for themselves. The idea of how do I cope up with the current challenges? How do I cope up with the situations when they come, when I am in the hospital, would be addressed by being a lifelong learner. And Thank more you. than that, when you talk about critical thinking and even making that student to be a critical thinker, the teacher themselves also have to be critical thinkers. In this, we are all referred to as reflective practitioners when we graduate or when we are working. So this also should be uh, preparing the student to be a reflective practitioner. A reflective practitioner would always want to know that uh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yes, I will do it. But later on, they'll go back into their own approach and practice and they will look at what they've done and weigh and say, was it the right thing? Can I do it better when the patient comes next time? Same to the lecturer. After teaching in the classroom, I need to go back and reflect and say, oh, what did I teach? How did I teach? Was the information adequate? Is there relevant information that I need to add? And this takes you back to being innovative. Innovation in health professions education is very important. If you have to prepare this student to be all around, to be competent, to be able to address issues in all levels of their working areas, you have to be innovative. And you have to instill to them that you have to be innovative. It doesn't have to be that when you receive a patient and you have nothing to do for them. So I think to that, I would want to stop there. I'm sure there are other uh, areas that we will address. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you have brought out an important point, which is growth. And I think we are all saying that for quality, students must grow. They must grow as they are inter in interacting in, in, in institutions and also lecturers and faculty need to be growing. I want to take a, a bit of a tangent now. Uh, we're still discussing about inputs uh, that are needed for quality training. We've talked about people. And I want to know whether there are other things apart from people that are needed. And I would like to uh, direct this question to Dr. Kelly. As you are, as we are going in focusing again on quality uh, training at KMTC, apart from people, are there other important components that you have identified that would be crucial for us to be able to de deliver that uh, quality training in the coming five years? Thank you so much. Uh, there are so many uh, issues that come with the offering quality training. And uh, I want to say that uh, the panelists here are so quite uh, elaborate about issues of input, like uh, the, the type of uh, lecturers we have, the type of facilities we have. But the, 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 to me, for us to offer quality for the next five years, there are certain elements that are key. Number one is the issue of uh, collaboration. And what I'm talking about collaboration here is uh, industry academia partnership. Uh, we realize that as a, an academic institution, we may never uh, keep up with buying the latest equipment all the time. However, the industry, the marketers, the the companies like GE are able to bring new equipment to hospitals every every other year. And as technology changes, they also change with that. So we then have to leverage on collaboration between ourselves and uh, the industry to ensure that uh, uh, we collaborate with them on teaching. We could teach with them, especially on uh, emerging technologies. So that uh, as we are doing our part here as an institution, as we instill theory and uh, 
the basics behind how things work, then we get the right technology, which is the most current, so that our students can bridge the learning in class and the actual experience at the workplace where they will go and work. The other issue for me that is a greater determinant of quality is going to be about um, the, the use of technology, that is ICT as an enabler. So uh, the institution is keen on investing on transforming uh, ICT, transforming uh, digital transformation in the institution. We believe that this is the key to this information age. We believe that the students who will leave this institution then should be able to work across any part of the world. And that means that they must be exposed to technology as early as possible, be able to do their work online, be able to do their exams online, be able to uh, feed data online, be able to access library online, and even be able to check their transcripts, their applications for various courses online. That this is going to be the norm rather than the exception. So quality to me will mean how they are able to integrate with the digital space. Again, uh, so we have to deliberately invest in that kind of um, venture to make sure our, our students are actually ones who are able to uh, be digital natives, not immigrants. Then the other issue that we would want to look at in terms of um, uh, input in terms of quality is uh, uh, leveraging on lecturer student ratio. We are aware of it and uh, we've pushed for budget to be appropriated for us to be able to achieve that. And I'm happy that uh, with the kind of budget that was read yesterday, we are then able to ensure that we have the proper uh, ratio of students and staff so that we have proper supervision of students in class, in the clinical area, in research, and therefore staff are not overwhelmed and they're able to do research that then translate into practice. The other issue that will uh, uh, determine our input on quality is the way we embrace and approach research. We have been doing research before, but we are now looking at it in a bigger perspective. I want us to look at uh, research in terms of uh, collaborative research, in terms of uh, being able to uh, participate in international conferences and being able to give uh, research a wider space than it is currently getting. And uh, there should be a way in which our students and staff collaborate to do research together. Then uh, again, quality will come. Uh, by the way we interact with our clinical areas. Uh, to me, uh, I believe that uh, as KMTC, we should be able to give our students sufficient amount of uh, exposure in clinical areas. So we then must be able to have uh, agreements with our clinical partners so that we have a wide spread, not only in uh, uh, the clinical setup, but other practical setups like industry, like uh, uh, spaces where our students need to get the kind of experience. So then to me, quality inputs for quality are going to vary and, and are going to be very different from what we have been doing previously in terms of effort, in terms of uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, input we must put in place for us to produce the students we want for the international and local market. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you for that input and giving us a snippet of some of the things that we will see uh, going forward in the next five years that will enhance the quality of our training. You mentioned something that was key about collaboration and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Wako, um, what is the role of regulatory bodies in partnership with the institutions of training that would enhance quality beyond licensure and registration? What more do regulatory bodies do to ensure that there's quality training? And I'm looking at it more on the collaborative aspects between 
us as KMTC and training institutions with regulatory bodies. Thank you so much. I think from uh, the regulatory point of view, the issue of registration and licensing normally comes, it is the tail end before, before we register and license. We have a number of things to be put in place. For one, to qualify as a clinical officer. And I say, as I said earlier on, it is starts from the very beginning of admission. From admission, where do we normally uh, have issues? Do we have enough human resource? And when we talk about the human resource, we are not only talking about the lecturers. We are talking, you know, the holistic in terms of management, in terms of administrative uh, workforce and personnel, and then in terms of uh, the lecturers, the lecturer student ratio. We have experienced uh, in many instances where there's a, a lot of desire to open uh, you know, medical training colleges and a more clinical medicine program. But ultimately what we see with this institution, if we are to accredit or approve it to train a clinical medicine, does it meet the requisite requirements? We normally have uh, what we call the, the checklist. And the checklist normally allows us to provide issues of mandatory in nature. <clears throat> and then there are issues of non-mandatory. When we talk of issues of mandatory, lecturers is one of them. For example, it is as a cornerstone. It is, you know, uh, the the basic uh, uh, requirement that an institution has to meet. Uh, for example, some institution may have one or two lecturers and they want to learn clinical medicine. Going by the core subject that they normally teach, do, is it adequate to have two lecturers to teach anatomy, physiology, pathology, and what have you? So the issue of human resource is critical. Secondly, the issue of physical facilities. Classrooms, do the institution have the classrooms? Okay. Uh, is it adequate? Is it ventilated? Does it accommodate well the student, especially in this era of uh, COVID-19? Okay. Has the institution complied with the rules and regulation of the COVID-19 of spacing? Then the other aspect of it is about the technology. Dr. Kelly has rightly put it, there's a paradigm shift from physical, especially with this COVID-19, uh, many institutions have gone into the digital world. How many institutions are prepared for this, the, the new technology, okay? Uh, especially issues of e-learning, okay? Issues of virtual learning. How prepared are these institutions? This is the, what I'm calling now the paradigm shift from the the usual face-to-face -face student to the virtual. How, how ready are these institutions? You know, other than the desire to open many institutions, probably some of them because of the monetary gain, what are the other aspects that go into? Uh, for example, issues of placement of a, of a student. After, you know, a certain period of time, this, this student definitely will go for practical attachments. Are there institutions which are well equipped in terms of the knowledge and in terms of his, for skills for this student to acquire? Do they have mentors in those places? Huh? Do you have clinical instructors in those places? Okay. So all these are the issues are, are of mandatory nature. Okay. Then, uh, some of the institutions, let me tell you about a few examples we have seen. You'll see an institution is about 30, 20 kilometers far away from the hospital where students are supposed to go for their practicals. This really will constrain the student and will constrain the institution. Some may mm -hmm. claim that they may have buses to transport, but look, some of them will also look at the cost 
the kind of course they, they are engaging in terms of transporting this student. Therefore, from now, the, the regulator's point of view, we will go a long way starting from the entry requirements, the requisite as far as the institution is concerned, requisite in terms of lecturers, in terms of the physical facilities, in terms of the areas of placement, in terms of transport, in terms of the digital technology, do they have uh, you know, resource centers for the students? So based on this, we normally approve this institution to train students. And we not only end there by allowing them to train, we do what is called surveillance inspection. If you, may, you may have an institution which has met the requisite requirement at the beginning, but over time, you will find the institution going down. And we have instances where we have even closed some of them because we have started with 10 lecturers and then you have only two after two, three years. What will happen? You will find that uh, some of them have migrated to greener pasture. So such institution will not allow them to continue. So that is why I was saying the issue of registration and licensing normally come at the tail end. But there are a number of things that we look at as a regulator that will make institution must meet those ones for us to allow, to accredit, to tell them to go and train clinical medicine. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you're saying, you know, I think we have got that quite clear that training institutions need to seek accreditation, that quality and accreditation go together. And there are requirements for that accreditation processes and institutions need to ensure that they're constantly meeting those requirements and not falling off. So thank you for that. And so that is a, a level of collaboration also with regulatory bodies ensuring and uh, that institutions continue to maintain the standards. Um, digital uh, technology has come up quite a bit in this conversation. And uh, I want us to now go a little bit into that. Uh, there is a question that has been asked about what can we learn from other sectors and industries? And I want to direct this question to Professor Hazel. Uh, I know that uh, you are involved in uh, the space of digital health. Uh, uh, and uh, what lessons can we learn about that, uh, that we can incorporate also in our, for, in our institution when we think of clinical uh, quality training? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for bringing up that. And I'm also very excited about the speakers that have come before me, especially on the issue of accreditation and on the issue of collaboration. As we are speaking right now, I mean, the US, it's actually uh, one o'clock, 1.31 o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock your time. And why am I here? Uh, because uh, Great Lakes University happens to be very strong in health sciences. And collaboration, I'm very glad that uh, KMTC is thinking about it and it is looking at uh, ways of uh, uh, improving on issues research and also collaborating with the industry in the, in the industries to ensure that uh, uh, they respond to the requirements because those are the... The, the employee, the employers, so they're actually responding to the to the market. Digitalization, when we look at it, and collaboration are go hand in hand. In the um, in the fact that uh, you can train from anywhere. We are in a situation or in a space that the uh, the training institutions that were started during uh, the colonial days, I've done a lot of research in relation to human resource in uh, health training. You find that the training, uh, the skills labs and the, uh, the practicum places are congested. But if we can have, a digi we can embrace the digital space, then we do not have to physically go there, but we can be able to demonstrate and students can be able to uh, practice um, uh, their, uh, can do their practicals without necessarily visiting uh, some of these uh, facilities. The placement sites have a problem in the sense that you find that all the, um, the cadres take their students for practicum in the same institution. 
we have shortage of uh, of of uh, of, of of those the facilitators in those in in those institutions so you find that the clinical officers the nurses the medical officers are being trained at the same time and therefore uh, what the medical officer know, uh, is supposed to learn and what the clinical officer or the nurse or the pharma or the pharmacist or whatever, they are so some of them will lapse but if we get into the digital space, then we can they can be able to see these demonstrations without necessarily having issues. And uh, they may also have the opportunity to collaborate with high-end institutions like John Hopkins, Harvard, and can be able to, uh, much as they will be in uh, in in the in the in the context, the rural uh, the the rural context or the uh, within their their facilities, they may be able to access very advanced technology and can be able to practice. I've, I've just finished a skills assessment of uh, MTRH and JOTRH on eye health, uh, their ability, their, their, whether they are able to, um, whether the, the JOTRH and MTRH are able, able to actually deliver eye health uh, services. And the reality is that um, in JTRH, we have a situation that the, the, uh, there are no equipment, and yet the health workforce are conversant with all this equipment, and they are able, to, even those that they are there are obsolete and need overhaul, but they know how they work, and they, they are requiring better. And for us to achieve or get better equipment, you know, the situation that the country is going through right now in terms of the economy, they can access it digitally in other countries and can get the sophisticated things. And, you know, we can also have laser uh, and, and digital treatment without necessarily uh, being there physically. And we can reach the masses, especially in the rural areas. Right now at uh, Grace Onyango Foundation, we are looking and we've gotten support by various uh, organizations like Rockefeller to just try and be able to be prepared uh, in readiness for any pandemic. I think COVID taught us that Africa is on their own. And unless they advance in technology and in the digital space, they can never be able to, to take care of the, themselves. If you, have, if you can appreciate, uh, we were left, Africa was left uh, to fend for themselves and until the rest of the world was satisfied. I think the grace of God is what helped us. So we have to be uh, more robust than, uh, than before and not having to be in a clinical placement physically, but can be able to access it digitally and even get the the best of the best because we can also treat digitally uh, in the current space and in the current uh, um, um, in the current space in technology and also in the in the in the in the health sector. So for me, let us as we consider collaboration, let us go beyond just uh, beyond just having collaboration with industry, but look at who else internationally that you can pair up with. And you can also do collaborative research and get funds. The truth is that every institution, including KMTC, I believe, may not have the right, the enough resources to be able to carry out um, their mandate and give quality to the students and the staff. But if we can have collaborations and even write a proposal for digital space and improvement, you may be able to advance in such a way that you may be the place that, um, that, that can showcase the best practices and what quality is in uh, training of uh, the health workforce. Thank you very much. Very much, yeah. Um, and I would like to ask Professor Mengich, are, are there also other lessons that we could learn from other industry players uh, that are just that are not necessarily medical uh, that can inform quality and our quality that, training? Doctor, Doctor, you have just forgotten something else. Yeah, yeah. It is sure, about the the curriculum. You know, yeah. we are collaborating and we are discussing about training, but we should also be alive to the contemporary issues and the emerging issues in the country. 
what are we responding to? We should not just be discussing what we've had all along, but we should be now looking at how best we can be able to uh, respond to the industry. Not, not collaborating to understand what they, but what are the issues? We've had situations that uh, the training institution, there is, there is a disconnect between the training institutions and uh, what the training institutions are doing and what uh, is actually needed out there, such that we are in a space that the uh, NGOs have come to bridge this. So as we are improving technology, as we prove improving, trying to meet our objectives and being strategic, let the strategy be in response to the realities and the challenges of the country. I think that is one thing that has always been forgotten, but we have to be alive to it now that we are talking a strategy that is alive and should be responding to our needs as a, a country. Sorry, I forgot that, but I think it is very critical. It's very key, it's very key. In fact, one of the questions that we were going to discuss and maybe we'll get some time is how do we make our curricula responsive uh, and, adapt and adaptable to emerging issues? Uh, so Professor Mengich, you can weigh in on uh, what other lessons can we learn from, from other industries and uh, maybe even about how can we respond appropriately? in our okay, curriculum design, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I am uh, happy that uh, Professor Mumba has really addressed issues that are very pertinent towards the realization of quality training. And as she mentioned about the curriculum, yeah, I think the issue here is uh, what, can, what, other, what can we do with other partners to improve this? And one of the things I noticed is uh, with stakeholders. I think when we talk about stakeholders, it includes even the students, the parents, the regulators, the policy makers, the teachers, the managers, and everyone. Uh, what can be done there is involve them in all these processes. If it is identifying a, a program that needs to be mounted up, there should be also that participation from the, the patients, the needs of the community, the needs of the, of the society or the country. So looking at that perspective, what else can be done and what needs to be done and sustain, for, for purposes of sustainability and bringing quality into place is involvement, partnership involvement, stakeholders involvement, so that we can achieve this quality training. Because if there will be all this participation, I uh, think for in terms of involving the, 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 the stakeholders who are the, the, the consumers of our products, those are the, the graduates, where are they going to be hosted? What type of a professional person do they want to be, to have in the, in the hospital? So look at this from also the perspective of the practicals where the students go. How much preparation do we ensure that uh, where they go for our practicals, for their practicals, they have, they own them. They want to take them through. They need to mentor them. And so do we have time also to look into the uh, mentors, that is the preceptors, the clinical instructors? How much uh, time do we have with them when we prepare our students to go and see what they do in the hospitals or what they see in the clinics. So we need to consider that and say, yes, these are the people that need to be brought on board. How is it done elsewhere? Uh, in other institutions I've visited and where we think we should be going is, we need to have a collaboration with the industry or the hospital where they go for practicals and thereafter agree or even who owns these mentors or clinical instructors so that they know when students are supposed to come to the world, they are responsible. And this improves their clinical teaching and practice. We also want to look at the internship opportunities. In other sectors and in other industries, they look at internship where even if after graduation, there must be a way to channel our graduates. I don't know whether in uh, 
help professionals from came to see whether they also go for internship. I know in the medicine, they do go for internship. Yeah. The government recognizes them. So that is one opportunity. I tend to think uh, the management should look at it and maybe request the government also to allow our graduates from KMTC to be put into partnership. Another thing is staff retention. How do we have uh, the issue of staff retention? Who are qualified and you have really taken them through a process so that they are able to handle certain areas? For example, I'm really thinking on this area of e-learning model and maybe the high fidelity skills laboratory. Imagine you can acquire, a, a, you can have a very good skills laboratory and you equip it very well. And uh, some of these people, you take them through some processes, but somehow they find greener pastures and they leave. What happens? There will be no one to come back again and retrain them. Maybe you again go back and somehow that is where we lose some track. When we, when we talk about what is done elsewhere, they look at the high fidelity simulation laboratory or the skills laboratory as one of the core areas as a bridge to ensure that this learner has learned or acquired the necessary competencies before they go to the real patient or to the real practice. So we need to look at this type of attention. How do we ensure that we don't lose them? Another thing is uh, evaluation and monitoring. How do we do we evaluate what we've done or even trained after maybe five years? Do we have tracer studies so that we can tell whether our students are performing well? Uh, we have some institutions that do their tracer studies. Uh, where I did my master's, that is the University of Dundee, we are still followed up to now. And that was in uh, uh, the year 2000 when I graduated. Every now and then after a year, they sent me a survey they ask me, where are you? What are you currently doing? Can we link you up with a student coming to Kenya? And this is now what, what is done elsewhere. Elsewhere, again, there is something called project-based learning. How do we ensure that uh, as we train our students or our professionals to be, they are able to also bring the idea of innovation? You see, we can only make them go and practice. But when they reach practice and they want to apply, they find their new equipment. They find there are some things which are so different from the ideal. How do we make them prepared? So I think the other concepts of yeah. the shift from uh, the, the traditional way we've been doing to the new concepts, that is more of not really fully a shift, but in the continuum of you're looking at it in a different perspective and becoming flexible so that we Thank can you. be able to uh, see what is happening and even try to understand whether it is possible. I look at it from project-based learning, such that if we have professionals like um, orthopedics technologies, these are people who, uh, when during the training, tell them there are other opportunities that when you're in practice, think of producing also those prosthetic limbs. We can have an industry within the institution. We are going out there and even trying to use our 3D equipment that we buy. What are these 3D equipment that can be able to do? We can have additional knowledge, maybe introduce short courses as it is done elsewhere in other countries. And uh, that can help them have Thank something Thank you. that can do. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gladys, uh, to speaking on to even some things that we have not yet come up in the conversation, but are key, which is the, the role of alumni in, uh, in the process of quality. Uh, and because the alumni have experience, they can provide mentorship, they are in industry, uh, and that's a very key uh, component uh, that needs to come up. I, I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Susan Muriongi, uh, um, here to speak about how do we address inequities? So we, we are preparing workforce for Kenya and beyond, but we know that we still have shortages. And, um, and so how do we, as an institution, ensure that we are meeting some of those inequities in some areas that are hard to reach 
or students who are coming from poor backgrounds or different backgrounds? How can we bridge that, the, the inequities that exist in our bid to provide quality uh, training? Maybe you can highlight one, one area that, that would be key. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I answer your question, let me say KMTC is a giant, if not the oldest uh, institution, uh, middle level institution producing health pro professionals. It is, it is the oldest and it has a rich history. And I would say with confidence because I'm widely traveled and anytime I go out, I visit a hospital the pro, the the, the um, uh, products of KMTC are employable globally. All of them, all of them, uh, and we need to maintain that. Inequalities will forever exist, not only in Kenya but world over. But there is a way we can be able to uh, at least mitigate that in KMTC. The government I know now considers uh, uh, the help loan, uh, even middle level uh, um, institutions, private institutions, I'm in a private institution and I know that. But there can, the, the institution can be able to create a fund, bursary fund, where they'll go out there as they collaborate with other meaningful institutions to uh, 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 feed into the fund. KMTC is big, it's a giant. If for example, we had, um, 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 where I'm coming from, I was a board member of Limuru Girls, it's a national school and I, I, I was charged to be in the, in the in the to be the chair of the board of Basari Kite, it I began it. I didn't know where to begin, but God gave me insights. And today it has a thriving Basari Kite that looks into the. Of course, we came up with a, with a, with quality. I mean, qualifications of who who can qualify to be that. So. KMTC can come up with that, and I'm sure there are well wishers who can feed into that, knowing the kind of candor we produce. Because of shortage of time, I would just say that um, um, th there is a time wh when I th there are two studies, two impactful studies that I did while I was in MTC, and the first one was the uh, accessibility of counseling services for students in KMTC that I did. That made me change professions into what I am today, a clinical psychologist. There's another one that I did on uh, 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 prevalence of burnout syndrome among staff, uh, 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 academic uh, uh, staff. That was shocking revelations, shocking revelations. You can go and read about it in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Google Scholar. That, that, that article is there, you can read. And the institution made two, two decisions. One, to, uh, I was charged with, uh, with opening up a counseling uh, 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 department or counseling service uh, 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 for KMTC Nairobi. And number two, um, I was given an opportunity to give a psychological education in a conference to lecture us to see how they can deal with that burnout. Burnout syndrome is a mental disorder that is work related. And I'm very glad that the, 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 the CEO talked about uh, uh, trying to improve the ratio, the student uh, staff ratio that can take care of that. So for, for, for inequities, that can happen. Of course, I, I am aware that there are other organizations that come up with sponsorship of students uh, uh, um, uh, who are from, uh, you know, underprivileged uh, places. And with that, with, with a kitty where KMTC itself, other than just 
looking at uh, it. Can, it can be, uh, for example, the hotel, the restaurant that you 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 bring out. What can you give back to the community as the MTC? Can can the rent of that uh, of that uh, of that uh, facility may it be a shop? In all the MTCs, can the rent be applied uh, 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 into that uh, um, um, uh, uh, kitty? Um, I think that's all that I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. You really have brought up a good aspect that we, in our bid to do quality training, we should leave no one behind, ensure that all our students can access that training and that the opportunities that are available are available for all. Uh, and I liked also the aspect of support that students and lecturers require support and it is an important arm of uh, quality training as well. We have talked about research and I would like to ask the panel era to just speak a little bit into what is the play, interplay between research output as institutions and quality training. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gisharu. This is a very vibrant discussion. I'm quite enjoying it. Yes, so as KMTC, our mandate uh, includes uh, training and includes research. Now, traditionally, we often give training outputs. So at graduation, we can say these are the numbers that we have trained. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to have research outputs, uh, which we do have, but maybe we have not given them prominence. But I want to speak into the integration that these two aspects of the mandate are not separate mandates. But now you can say I'm doing a training and uh, on the other hand, I'm doing research. They must be seen to be integrated uh, such that all our community is engaging in both and they are informing one another so that we are doing research that informs training, but also informs the health sector. Like, uh, I, like, like what Dr. Moriogi has said <clears throat> about her research, informed uh, the policies, informed the, the administration, creation of offices, informed how we treat our staff. So that is what we're saying. We'd like to see more of uh, evidence from research being used to inform training, also being in, used to inform administrative policies, being uh, used to inform uh, even the health sector. On the other hand, the training should also strengthen research. So we must have a component uh, that uh, as we are doing training, we are also uh, bringing the aspect of research and not separately saying I'm just teaching research methods, but also if I'm teaching a subject, what has the research said? Like if you realize, like even in today's discussion, we have an anchor paper that we have shared uh, with panelists. We are discussing, seeing what some of the research that affects the things we are doing has already found, maybe research in the uh, health labor market, an aspect of research. How can it help us? even as we make this discussion. So we'd like to see more of uh, raising the profile and the visibility and the quality of research uh, in addition to the quality of training. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I know that is another key result area in our uh, new strategic plan, research and innovation. Unfortunately, our time has gone by very fast and we are actually coming to the end of our panel discussion. And I would like to take this opportunity to give every panelist uh, a, a chance to make some parting remarks, uh, maybe about a minute, uh, something that as KMTC we will take home as your, your final remark to us. And I would uh, like to start with them, Mr. Wako. All right, so I will then uh, pass it on to uh, Professor Gladys Mengich to make your final remarks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kishero. I'm going to make my final request, uh, remarks. Thank you, everyone. I think it has been a good opportunity to meet you people. When I see you people at KMTC, I remember where I started and I want to say congratulations. Parting uh, short, Quality training is an in-training process that requires us to identify our learning needs in relation to solving the issues in our country, especially in the health sector. The universal health coverage is very important. And so I tend to look at it from the primary healthcare perspective. 
we need to ask ourselves, how best can we use the approach of primary care so that we can reach the person in the rural area? And that is my take. But that has to go through a process of uh, identifying the learning needs and the learning outcomes. That takes us to quality training. Thank you very much. I wish you well, and God bless you in all your endeavors in what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Wako, I can see your back on air. You want to make some yes. parting comments, yeah? Thanks so much. Sorry, I, I didn't know that I really muted, but I have been on. Uh, I really thank KMTC for having brought us to that the issue of the quality training uh, in our institution. My parting shot is we'd like to have a greater collaboration with the KMTC as a trainer, as, as a regulator, for us to attend the desired quality training. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Dr. Susan Morionki. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, mine is to say that uh, being aware that 85% of all health personnel in this country of ours are from KMTC, we need to be preview of our standing and ensure through the Office of the Academic uh, uh, um, um, uh, Deputy Director that curriculums are reviewed every five years. You see, there's danger of uh, ignoring because there are no regulations from Q every five years to ensure that we capture the needs, the needs of uh, uh, or the changing threads and the need. I am aware that currently all higher diplomas are based in Nairobi, and I'm sure that is not enough. Personally, as a mental health professional, I know we only have less than 200 psychiatrists in Kenya today, less than 200, and the three quarters of them are based in big towns. In the rural areas, where we, which we call the primary levels, where our, our uh, uh, graduates are, it means there are no mental health professionals there. Because I know, I know in KMTC, unless if somebody is doing nursing in psychiatry or clinical officer in psychiatry, the rest just do introduction to psychology. Yet, suicide, which is a symptom of major mental health issues, is number three killer in the world. Number three killer in the world. So we need to review our curriculums at least to capture the needs of the people. Uh, number two, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to, to encourage the CEO to have uh, recognition uh, systems of lecturers who are doing immense and great work. It doesn't have to be necessarily increments of salaries, no, there are many other ways. So that occasionally, even as we have the best student, the best work, the best work we can have, the best, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, lecturers who have done immense in immense work in ensuring a quality of a uh, 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 training among students. Um, briefly, yeah. that's what I can say. And on Gera MTC, I'm proud to be an MTC. And thank you very much, Professor Hazel. What would be your parting remarks? Yeah, first and foremost, congratulations to KMTC. Uh, over the years that I've interacted with you, I can see uh, steady progress of, uh, and the intention to improve. Uh, that, that for me shows um, character and uh, led by your CEO, you're only looking for what is best for this country. I want to encourage you as the frontliners. You're the ones who produce the frontliners in the health sector in, the, in this country, which means those that you produce are the first people that get into contact. Excellent. 
Yeah. The people that you yeah, the people that you produce are the first ones to get into contact with the patients. And therefore, they have, they themselves are quite a resource that you can use as part of your research. And when you use them as part of the research, then you will be able to train for the, the country and on the emerging issues that are affecting this country. So your alumni are very, are your asset in terms of improvement of quality and improvement of uh, 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 health service delivery in this country. And what I can encourage you is uh, about is that you should match your training with uh, infrastructure and uh, integrate it with, uh, uh, with, with, with technology. If you do that, then you are definitely, of course, I, I, before I, I uh, before we had this panel, I was reflecting and I realized that I've interacted with a lot of KMTC students and uh, basically uh, there has been no adverse complaint about any student or any alumni that I can talk of, which means your work is good and uh, con uh, continuous improvement is, is, is a process that you can never stop. Just continue doing the good work. I'm proud of you and I'm available. If there is anything that I can do to support the process, count me in and God bless you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And uh, finally, I would like to invite our CEO uh, to make his uh, parting comments. We have come to the end of our panel discussions that, that are part of our strategic plan uh, launch. And uh, so Dr. Kelly, you're welcome to to make your remarks. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Wagaki, for that opportunity. Um, my parting remarks, uh, number one, uh, I want to thank our panelists who have ably uh, contributed to the subject of quality and we have taken your pieces of advice uh, seriously so that we are able to input it into our day-to-day -day actions and in our strategy. Uh, secondly, I want to reiterate the commitment of KMTC to quality, and we are conscious about the need to ensure we continuously improve uh, the, teaching uh, the, the teaching and learning at KMTC and what we provide to our learners. Uh, with that, we will consciously uh, apply resources to uh, the inputs we need to ensure that quality is achieved. We will also ensure that the processes that we undertake are properly supervised and that uh, students and staff adhere to the ethics and norms that require us to work within. Uh, as an institution, I know that we are uh, continuously learning and we require a lot of support from all our partners. And uh, we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Susan Muriungi. We want to thank you, uh, Professor Hazel Miseda, uh, Professor Mengich, and uh, Ibrahim Wako for this uh, level of commitment to be with us, discuss with us for almost two hours. I know for a VC, that is quite a lot of time. Uh, with the kind of uh, schedule you have, including uh, our very own Susan Muriungi and uh, uh, Wako. Uh, we appreciate, we will always welcome your feedback and uh, support. And also in any case, you can refer to us partners for collaboration, we are happy to engage. We will always uh, also invite you for our uh, for the uh, launch of the strategic plan, we were advised by Treasury to postpone from 28th because of uh, the need to align to the bottom-up economic transformation agenda and be able to then uh, set a new date for which we will have the strategy being launched. We will look forward to your presence and your valued uh, uh, consideration to come to be with us. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate your contribution. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, panelists, attendees, viewers.
This has been a very insightful and engaging uh, discussion. And I would uh, like to now invite the chaplain back to make a closing prayer that would mark the end of this uh, session. So chaplain, you're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. and CEO. We'd like now to pray. We'd like now to pray the benediction, the front prayer. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you. We want to honor you. We appreciate the good work that was started since 1927 here at Kenya Medical Training College. We want to thank you for the trainings taking place. We want to thank you for our panelists who are presented. Almighty God, we have seen your power being demonstrated within Kenya Medical Training College. Okay. Now, O oh Lord, we pray that you may bless us and keep us in your name. And now may the Lord God bless you and keep you. The Lord God has his face to shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessings of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. And now with the grace Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God Amen. and the fresh of the, the Holy, Holy Spirit be with us, us now Amen. and forevermore. Amen. Amen. May God bless Kenya. God bless Kenya. Medical Training College. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good. Oh, mind is good night. Have a good night. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good Bye. night. Good day. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. So, KMC team, please remain on board. KMTC team. At least plus panelists. <laughs>